Okay, so we're going to be looking at postmodern architecture first. Um, we're going to be looking at architecture today and kind of wrap that up. Um, and then we'll go on to other art forms. So what I want to do when we kind of think about postmodernist architecture is really think about what existed before, right? So what are we looking at when it comes to modernist architecture, okay? So if you remember the characteristics, Le Corbusier is a good example of that, okay? Remember that form follows function, right? We have a building that makes sense for um, its purpose, right? We think about the functionality of the spaces. A lot of times they're adaptable. So sometimes you have things like moving walls, right? Um, and things like shutters and sun, like sun um, uh, skylights and things to let sun in, that sort of thing. Um, they use a lot of modern materials. Um, there's an elimination of decoration and it's very clean and functional. So when we look at back at S Savory House, right? You can see it's very clean, it's very pristine. There's a lack of detail, there's a lack of ornamentation. There's like really very little decoration to it. Um, and when we look at um, later modern architecture, remember we have that geometric, right? Of like Mies van der Rohe, right? You know, basically we have steel and glass skyscrapers, but we also have organic architecture. So this is things that we use for cultural and religious institutions. Sort of like the, the circular Guggenheim Museum in New York City. Um, and so it's very, very simplistic. So then we have kind of this transition. Um, when we look at um, some of the architecture that's coming later um, in kind of in the transitional period, you see that it's still very bare, right? There's not a lot going on, but notice how there is some decoration, right? There's some breaking apart of the, the structure. We often call that deconstruction, right? It's kind of like cubism where the, the building looks fragmented or segmented. So less is bore. Remember less is more, that's something Mies van der Rohe said. And that's that very simplistic glass steel structure. Postmodernism is often considered less is bore. So like less is boring, right? So what we'll see is a rejection of the, the purity of international style, right? That's that, er, that modernist style. We'll see that they will borrow from popular sources as well as past styles. So we'll see a lot of neo styles during this time. Um, there's a sense of eclecticism, pluralism, color, ornamentation, historyism, and deconstruction. And it really does get elaborate, sometimes like over the top. Some of these buildings, I must say, are kind of considered gaudy today. Some, especially some of these early pieces, people kind of like, they, they, they don't particularly love them, right? And so this is this house, right? This house right here, this is the, the plan for it. So you can see that, it's not necessarily symmetrical anymore. It's not really a perfect mathematical precise building. There's a sense of flow still to it. And that was done by the architect Robert Venturi. So Robert Venturi's um, house in Castle County, Delaware is basically a transitional piece. Um, it's in unit four, right? So it's not in unit 10, it's in unit four, but this really does kind of leap into the rest of our discussion for today, okay, in architecture. So the, the main architect, Robert Venturi, but we also have his associates, John Rauch and Denise Scott Brown. And so we have two images for this house. We have the front of it and we have an interior shot, right? So let's just look at it and kind of look at, you know, it in kind of the most basic terms. How is this a conventional farmhouse? In what ways is this a conventional farmhouse? Isabella, can you help me? Is there any characteristics here that kind of say, oh, 
This is just a typical home. Um, it's painted white and it's roof has like those like wood sheets. Right. I'm gonna turn you up just a little bit. The volume went down, right? But and it's white, right? It's kind of like the white house with the picket fence. Of course, we don't see a fence, but it has the air of it, right? Anything else about it besides it being white? Isabella, you could have said something else, but I couldn't hear you. Did you say anything besides it being white? Uh, yeah, I said like the roof had like wooden shingles. Right, it's got wooden shingles. If you look at the roof itself, it has that pointed gable, right? So it has this gable roof, right? That's pretty typical of a standard farmhouse, right? Even a standard city house, right? Anything else, right? Um, it has a porch, right? So this is kind of like the porch area here and it has these columns and a lot of porches are hung up, like uh, held up by columns or posts, right? Let's look at how it's different, right? How is it different than modern architecture, right? Venturi had another phrase, right? When he, his is not less is more, his is not house is, is a machine for living or less is bore. Venturi said, messy vitality over obvious unity. So this, this as a art teacher and as an artist who doesn't like clutter, this probably makes me a little anxious, right? So messy vitality over obvious unity. So obvious unity is, it doesn't really feel like it goes particularly well together, right? There's a lot of components that don't necessarily feel like they fit together, right? So when we look at it, you can see that it takes on many different styles. So in its architecture, we're gonna see that it has a lot of styles from the past, right? It's not just a conventional farmhouse, it's gonna have other elements to it as well. And it also, which I forgot to highlight here, but it says at the bottom, in architecture, it has deconstruction, right? Some of the parts of it don't really look like they are a part of the main structure. It's kind of broken apart. So it is, this part right here does go with the deconstruction. So Venturi studied architecture in Rome, right? And when you look at this piece, this, uh, piece of um, architecture, what historical references to the design recall something that maybe you would see in Rome? What do you think? Quana, do you see anything that's kind of Roman inspired? Maybe the columns. Right, it's got columns, very good, right? Um, it has, um, kind of like a, a rounded arch as well. So this is the atrium of the Medici Palace, right? And so it has columns, it has rounded arches, and you see that here as well. Now, the interesting thing is, is these columns are kind of fake. They're actually flat, right? So these are basically two-dimensional, right? They're flat, they're, they're pieces of wood that look like columns, and they hold up right, this gable roof with a rounded um, arch kind of as the facade of that porch. Sorry. And then it also has some mannerist characteristics. So if you guys remember mannerism, we don't have any mannerist architecture, but we did look at it. And so mannerism is kind of fake and artificial when it comes to architecture. And so this is Villa Rotunda. This is a country farmhouse on the outskirts of Venice, right? And then this is in Venice, right? This is um, Santa Maria Maggiore in Venice, right? And this facade is kind of stuck on top of the church, right? It's very thin and it looks like it's kind of pasted on the front. Is there anything about our country house 
um, in Delaware that looks artificial? What looks artificial about it? Jasmine, can you help me out? Um, like all of the sh shapes don't look very natural. It kind of seems like it's like slapped on. Right. So this right here on the roof is basically there for privacy. The homeowners really like to bird watch. And so they would be out in the windows, staring out them with their binoculars. But they also want a sense of privacy. And so they had these, they, they, you know, they tell Venturi, Roush, um, and Brown that that's what they were interested in. So they put this here so they could still have privacy, but be able to see through it, right? And it has continuity because this is the other side. So it matches the rounded arch on the porch of it, right? But it really is kind of slapped onto the facade, right? It's slapped onto the outer part and it just, it's kind of clunky, right? It doesn't really feel like it fits or belongs. So the front and the rear are this decorated shed, right? So they have these kind of almost like, they function almost like screens, um, where you, it looks like it's separate from the main structure of the house, right? It's deconstructed. Um, the, you know, those two-dimensional elements generate visual interest and meaning. I don't know what that strange uh, logo is over the end. Interesting. Um, the front facade incorporates a floating arch, which we talked about, and it gives us the privacy that they wanted so they could bird watch, right? So this gives privacy and this gives privacy. So the rear of it, um, has those flat Doric columns that we mentioned, right? And it feels a little cartoonish in a way, right? It feels very artificial. And so that's kind of that mannerist sort of quality to it. It makes it feel kind of whimsical in a way. Okay, now the interior of it, we have a picture and this is a music room, right? For the household. And so when we look at the interior, it's said to be inspired by Baroque architecture, right? So I put some Baroque pieces there for you. Here is Borromini's architecture that we talked about in the Baroque. And then this is the interior of an opera house for you guys. What is Baroque about the interior of the music room? Alana, can you help me out? Is it um, theatrical, like with all of the colors and shapes? Right, it's kind of over the top decorated. It doesn't maybe have as many like sculptural flourishes at, or, you know, gold leaf or like really like, when I say sculptural, I do mean like the little pooties and the projected cornices and all that elaborate niches and cornices but it does have these arches that are not like smooth and pointed. They're not round, right? They've got this sense of ornamentation to them, kind of hanging from them. And then of course they're painted, right? And they're very elaborate. And there's just a lot of detail to them. I don't think this is a ceiling fan. I think this is just a light, um, you know, a light in the center room just kind of feels like it has a ceiling fan, but there's this, this you know, those very circular bulbs on the top of it. It's very, you know, it has a sense of over the top kind of decoration. It also supposedly has some Gothic qualities to it as well, right? It has like a quatrefoil pointed arch. That's that lobe characteristic, but it's almost like in the reverse, right? Remember that, and I should have put a picture here, a quatrefoil or a pointed arch was like these rounded pointed, like rounded lobes that led to a pointed arch. And this almost has the reverse of it. And then it also has some Art Deco, which is not in R250. But if you remember, Art Deco was really popular in like the 1920s. And that too had a sense of geometry and ornamentation to it. Um, 
but we do have like uh, Maria Martinez sculpture, like remember her black on black pottery that is in the art deco style, right? So this kind of geometric de detail that you see on the arches and then even in like the light fixtures is a part of the art deco. I think that house, this house is kind of, you know, a little difficult to kind of get through. But if you know that it has all of these influences from all these different art styles, and then you understand, you understand where it's all coming from, I think you'll be okay on it. Any questions on our country home in Delaware? Okay, uh, this is a great example of how a lot of postmodern architecture takes inspiration from popular culture. I don't know if you guys know what a payphone is, right? But when I was a kid and I was somewhere without my parents, I'd have to have a quarter and I would call my parents on a payphone. And this it was the headquarters for AT&T, right? So a phone company, right? Um, and so the building, their headquarters was designed to kind of look like a telephone booth. So the main atrium had this slit in it that kind of looked where, like where you'd put the quarter, right, um, of that telephone. And then it also had characteristics of furniture. So this is Victorian furniture, like a high boy um, with that kind of cutout piece at the top, right? It almost feels like it has drawers to it. So a lot of architecture is really designed on, you know, this past aesthetic. Right. So the next few buildings we're going to look at are museums. And so when we think about how museums, art museums have been um, created in the last 200 years, really there's two different styles that are dominant. Okay. One is neoclassical. So most of our major museums in Chicago are in this neoclassical style the exterior of the Art Institute of Chicago, right? The Field Museum, uh, the Science and Industry Museum, they all look like they are Greek temples, right? Greek or Roman temples. However, sometimes they have additions to them, like the Art Institute has an addition that is postmodernist, or the, like the Museum of Contemporary Art is a postmodern building, right? And so neoclassical is very common. The other style is this organic international style where it's much more uh, free form, right? And so thinking about, you know, museums often came from palaces as well. So like the Louvre in Rome, right, was what used to be the French palace in Paris, right? And then the Villa Borghese was the home of a wealthy Roman family. So we either build our own buildings, right, in a past style or the current kind of modern style, or we adapt existing structures, right? So postmodernism in the United States, this, these are the National Galleries of Art in Washington, DC, and they were created by I.M. Pei. So the architect is I.M. Pei, he passed away, I think, a couple of years ago, and he's a great example of the deconstruction, right? Notice how there's this geometric simplicity to it, but notice how the building seems separated. It feels like it's been sliced and diced and kind of like pulled apart, right? And so this is that deconstruction in architecture. So here you can see he has um, you know, cut out, he's truncated, that's a fancy word for cut out, truncated parts of the building. Um, he's known for these little glass um, pyramids and actually that glass pyramid is by I Am Pay too. So where you go get your tickets, if you go see the Louvre, that's made by I Am Pay, this American architect. And then this is the interior of the National Gallery. So you can see how um, the, the functionality of it. So like the um, escalators and the walkways 
are like separated from the structure, like the inner workings of how things work are separate. They're not hidden in the walls, right? You can actually see them. Um, this is the Pompidou Center in Paris. Um, this is by Renzo Piano. And this is a great example of how sometimes you see the inner workings of a structure on the outside of the building. And so all of this, right, is color coded. So like red is for like movement of people and green is for like ventilation and blue is for like water. And so it's all color coded. And so as you look around it, you see the structure and it kind of is reminiscent of like the Crystal Palace where you can see the inner workings from the outside. So this is the Modern Museum in Paris. Um, he is the one who designed the addition. So the addition that we have at the Art Institute of Chicago for the Modern Wing, that is by the architect Renzo Piano. This is pretty typical of his current work, right? So the first uh, museum that we have to look at today is the Guggenheim. So the, the Guggenheim Museums, um, they have a series of museums all around the world. And so this one was built in Bilbao, Spain, and the architect is Frank Gehry. So this is number 240 in your note takers. Make sure you're writing down your notes as we go, right? Um, he is a Canadian American um, architect. Um, currently he works out of LA. Um, he's known for his organic architecture. Um, often when his buildings, um, one of the things that he often does is he likes projects where he is trying to revitalize different neighborhoods, right? So he's trying to revitalize different neighborhoods um, and to bring prosperity back to certain neighborhoods that are kind of like falling apart. And one of the things that he does is he uses computer software, not only to design his buildings, which is pretty typical, right? Today, architects very rarely draw things by hand. Normally, they draw things with computers, right? Um, but he not only designs by computer, but also he fabricates or has parts of his buildings fabricated by technology. So when you look at this structure, there's a lot of curves to it, right? It's not like you can go to a standard like um, building uh, supply company and go, oh, I need all of these materials to build my thing. They have to be kind of custom made for each building, right? Because he's not using just standard I-beams. He's not just using standard glass. He's not just using standard sheets of metal, right? They have a curvature to them. So all of this is made specially for his buildings. So they're, of course, very expensive to build. But he is actually one of the most probably popular architects in the world. Right, so he is often compared to Italian Baroque architects. Um, so of course, in our series of R250, we have one Baroque architect, we have Baromini. How would you say his work is similar to the work of Baromini? Jeffrey, can you help me? How is his work similar to Baromini? I put Baromini's work here at the bottom and the right for you. Uh, aren't they both like wavy? Exactly. Baromini had very few flat shapes to his work. And so there's a lot of concave and convex um, curves to his architecture. So remember how he had that undulating facade and then his dome isn't circular, right? It's not perfectly round. Instead, it's oval. Sorry, let me let Cora in here. Okay, um, and so he has those undulating surfaces, right? When we look at his work, um, the location really does influence the design, right? Can you see what's located right next to the building? It's water, right? So there's water right next to it. And so um, 
it's the whole structure is supposed to kind of look like a ship. This is in the port in Bilbao. And this was an industrial port that had some economic decline. And so this was part of revitalization program in Bilbao to bring people and money to this uh, part of Spain. Right, so it looks like a ship, kind of looks like it's, um, you know, flo uh, floating and hovering in the space. And so here you can see it's kind of in its neighborhood. You can see how curvilinear and how like broken apart it has kind of that deconstructed sort of quality, but then it's in this industrial port, right? So you can see that there are houses and neighborhoods here, but this led to a whole revitalization revitalization of this area. You know, there's new bridges, there's new parks, all connected to the museum and the museum campus. Right? So how is this different than Guggenheim in New York? How is this different than Wright's vision of a museum? Right? How is this different? Right? It's got that deconstructed element to it. So it has a lot of separate parts to create the whole, right? It's based on the historyism, a historical style of Baromini, right? We've allowed those swirling forms with more detail. It's not as clean and pristine as the circular nature of Wright's work. You know, Wright's work wasn't necessarily completely bare, right? It had a little bit of decoration to it, especially with this kind of um, cornice at the very base, but it definitely is not as detailed as the Bilbao one, right? And then one of the things that you'll notice is the surface of the museum is not entirely smooth. So what they will do is they use titanium on the surface and there's this sense, it's kind of, um, it looks like little dents, right? So basically we, we call this chasing in sculpture. You ever seen a metal sculpture that's not smooth? It kind of looks like it's hammered in like a uniform way. And then of course with the light, it kind of glitters and reflects and you see the texture on the surface. So it has a surface quality that we don't normally see in, in modern architecture, right? Modern architecture is gonna be very smooth and clean and pristine. So on the exterior of the Bilbao, we have a lot of, um, of, of sculptures. And so this is Louise Borghese. We saw her um, have one of these at the Tate Museum um, in that atrium that we saw um, Shibboleth in. Um, this is Anish Kapoor. You guys know the bean in Millennium Park, right? This is the same sculpture here, right? And then this is Jeff Koons, who we'll talk about a little bit later today. Um, this is his topiary called Puppy, right? And so this is the atrium. So this is how you get into the museum and you can see how it has kind of like a porch. So it has one column, right? One column that holds up this porch and then it has a lot of glass windows to let in light. Right, and then that leads you inside the atrium. Okay, so this is the atrium of Bill Bell, and this is the atrium of Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim in New York City. And you can see that he was making some nods to Wright. Right, he didn't just say, "Oh, I'm going to sur like surpass Wright." Like he actually made some nods to it. Look at the skylight by Frank Lloyd Wright how it has that kind of undulating quality to it. And notice how he divided his up in, in a very similar way. So he kind of made a nod to write in the style, but of course it's much more broken up and deconstructed. So it doesn't necessarily always look stable. So that here's some interior shots of the museum. Right. And so, like I had mentioned, um, this is part of the revitalization program. I think you have a plan of this one as well. And so when you look at the plan, 
Um, the thing to know that is that not only is it part of the building, but also we have its connection with the city. So it's connected by bridges, right? Um, it's by the train tracks. So that helps you remember that this is an industrial um, section, right? It's by the river. And that also it has a whole museum campus. So there's parks associated with this as well. And then here's the program. He uses a program called Katia, which he uses to design the structures. So here's just a reminder about how he creates it. And then here's some other structures from around the world. You can see how similar they are. Um, this is just a Google search of all of his buildings. But like I said, he does a lot of revitalization of different parts of the city. So this is the LA Opera House. I think it's called Disney. I think it's owned by Disney or they were the patrons of it. Uh, this is the Pritzker Pavilion in Millennium Park, which you guys are probably familiar with, right? And that was part of a revitalization of the park system in downtown Chicago too. So his amphitheater, I've been there several times for concerts, um, maybe you have too, is done by Gary, right? Any questions on Frank Gary? Okay, the next architect we have is Zaha Hadid, and this is a firehouse that she designed, a firehouse. Very practical, right? Very practical, right? So Zaha Hadid's piece, is the maxi um, two, two, uh, 2000. So um, the National Museum of, this is the modern art museum in Rome, Italy. I've actually never seen this structure. I can't wait to go back and see it. Um, she's an Iraqi born British based architect. Um, she actually died in 2016. And she's known for her organic architecture um, the interesting thing is, is that this one is kind of a more of a blend of geometry and organic detail. And her works tend to have a sense of flow to them. So there's a lot of undulating surfaces and curvular, uh, cur curvilinear elements to her work. You can see that in the ceiling above her head in the portrait. Okay. So when we look at her style, can you see how she was influenced by modernist architecture? Jeffrey? Oh, no, I already called on Jeffrey. Um, Emily, do you mind helping me out? What's modernist about this? How does it look like maybe Le Corbusier or Frank Lloyd Wright or Mies van der Rohe? Right, it's very clean and pristine, right? It's got real, a lot of flat surfaces. Like there's a, you know, a deconstructed component to this building, but it's got a lot of flat sort of smooth surfaces to it. There's not a lot of decoration. Um, there's a lot of parts to it, but there's not a, decor a lot of decoration on those parts. And then of course, postmodernist is that it is very deconstructed, right? There's a deconstructed element to it. So it's broken apart, it's shifted. There's parts that stick out from one another. There's lots of juxtapositions of elements. And so this is interesting. This is in a, a Roman neighborhood um, that I actually remember. Um, this is more of the kind of the modern city of Rome. It was like in the north side of the city. And this is actually where they once upon a time had the Olympics in Rome. And you actually can see an old Olympic structure in this photo right here on the far upper left corner, right? So that's like an old sports arena for the Olympics. But when you look at this part where the museum is, this is the museum right here. You can see that it's in a neighborhood and kind of like in an industrial center. I believe this also was a place where um, there was an army um, 
like a military setup. So there's some barracks here as well, right? And so look at how the building interacts, right? Can you see how it, can, it really does fit into the available space? It almost looks like it is a, um, a train station. When I look at it, I see train station because it looks like it has like the main facility and then it looks like it runs along like train tracks is like trains are gonna pull out of the station, right? So this was meant to kind of fit into the existing neighborhood. So that's one of the reasons why it bends, right? And that's something that architects often do. They think about how their buildings can interact with the neighborhoods in which they exist. How can they make the lives of the people who live and work in this area better, right? So when you look at the, the building up close, you'll notice that it has columns and concrete. How does columns and concrete relate to the city of Rome? Cora, can you help me? How does concrete and columns relate to the city of Rome? How might this be a nod to the past? Um, I mean, they used columns a lot in the classical architecture. Yeah. And concrete, isn't it like, um, it was like a local material or something? Right. It's how they built those colossal structures. Remember that places like the Colosseum could be built in 10 years because they could use this cheaper, faster building material of concrete to create these really enormous structures. So she intentionally tried to make a nod, right? To, I'll go back to the image, um, of using concrete, right? And of using columns, but doing it in a contemporary way, right? Doing it in a postmodern way. So this doesn't feel like a neoclassical structure. And when you look at the inside of it, you can see that um, people, right? The people kind of move around the building. And one of the big complaints about this structure is that the interior is so elaborate, right? One of the complaints is the interior is too busy. And so what people look at is they're like, it's almost like you notice the beauty of the building rather than the art that's in it. But Zaha Hadid had made staircases and walkways so that you could move from one part of the structure to the next. So you could move from the galleries, okay? And when she was designing it, and we saw that in the aerial view as well, you might've noticed that the ceiling was made out of glass, right? Because as um, a lot of art, um, excuse me, a lot of art museums have a lot of windows to let in natural light. It's really sometimes the best way to be able to see art, but also it can be very damaging. Right, it can like dull the color of paint and, and so on. It can make some things um, very fragile. And so it has these cantilevers. So the ceiling has these cantilevers that block out some of the light. So we get some light and we don't get some light, right? So it kind of dampens the power of the light. So she uses um, lighting, right? And then she uses these walkways and all of the details of this museum are either white, gray, or black. So she doesn't want to take away, she doesn't make it colorful. She didn't want it to take away from the artwork that's on display. And I think what's hilarious is no matter how many photos I tried to find of this museum, I very rarely find photos with art on the walls. I guarantee there is some, but um, it's supposed to, feel more subtle so that you notice the beauty of the art there. Oh, this is the part that I mentioned, the controversy of it. Like I said, some people think it's a little too busy. This is kind of her typical stuff. I mentioned that she uses a lot of curvilinear elements, but once again, noticing how the structures kind of conform to the landscape. Um, she did a series of buildings. I mentioned she's Iraqi, but she, she was based out of London. And she was one of the lead designers for the um, London Olympics. So a lot of her, the, this is the swimming facility. 
And then she's done countless soccer stadiums around the world, um, especially in Japan. Okay, that is architecture. We're done with architecture. Any questions on that? Okay, well, we just looked at a bunch of um, kind of elaborate architecture that I would dare say was very high end, right? Very kind of, uh, I don't want to say hoity toity, but I'll say that hoity toity. Um, it's kind of leads us to our next section, which is looking at how postmodernism and how art addresses class and society. So we're going to look at global art after 1980. And our first artist is Jeff Koons. And Jeff Koons is an interesting character. Um, his style is often considered neoconceptual and neo-pop. So neoconceptual would mean it's about what? Does anyone have a guess about, remember what conceptual art is about? Katie, can you help me? Um, it's like focused on the idea. Right, it's about the idea and of neo pop, right? Remember pop comes from popular culture. So one of the first pieces I was ever um, taught, taught about Jeff Koons is actually the piece that's on the screen. And I just think it's really funny. He took a bunch of vacuums and he put it in a, in a plexiglass box and he called it art. And of course, when I looked at it, I was like, wow, like my mom has that, right? It's like, I don't really understand. But he looked at it like, okay, this is like the high end model of the day. Like this is 1980s, like only the best of the best vacuums. And so he thought of it as something that would be prized and he put it in a box. And then of course, today we look at it, we see them as relics. So it's kind of interesting how the, the, the meaning of it kind of changes. Like it used to be like, this is the best vacuum. And now it's kind of like, this is old right? We've got better things now, right? So that leads us to Jeff Koons 230. We have our Pink Panther, right? So Jeff Koons is from Philadelphia, um, and he works out of New York City. Um, he's known as a um, neo-pop artist. Um, he draws from popular culture. Um, he looks at pop culture. He looks at the concept of celebrity and commercialism, um, focusing on things like stereotype, but also sen uh, sentimentality. Um, he's kind of a controversial artist. Um, a lot of his work, being that he's neoconceptual, right? A lot of his work is not made by him, right? He hires people to build things for him all the time. So he's like the idea guy. Um, He's also a little controversial because he once upon a time worked in the gallery system. And um, he was an artist, he was an artist, he worked in the gallery system and he decided to, um, you know, part of the controversy is how expensive some of his pieces are. Like they're very expensive and he doesn't make them. <laughs> okay, so a lot of his work that he's known for is inflatables. So at the MCA, they have this. It looks like a, a safety wrap, but it's actually cast out of bronze. Um, he has a lot of those balloon animals um, or inflatable. So this is at the MCA too. This is called Bunny. And so it looks like a Mylar balloon, but it's really made out of metal and it's, it's chromed and you can see your reflection in it. And then these are his um, you might have seen commercials for Masterclass. You guys know what I mean by Masterclass? No? Masterclass? It's basically where the rich and powerful and influential, will, you can pay them to teach you a class. And Jeff Koons teaches you about creativity, and he's actually building um, balloon animals. I've seen the advertisements on social media. Um, so a lot of his pieces are based on this. Some of them are colossal. So this is a rather large piece on the right. But 
he works a lot in appropriation, right? Appropriation is where we borrow imagery. So where is he borrowing his imagery? Where is he borrowing his imagery? From commercialism, popular culture, right? These are things you could buy, like the bunny, right? You could buy a Marlai balloon of a bunny, or you might go to a party and get a balloon animal. So like kids party, right? A lot of his artwork is based on kitsch. Do you guys remember us talking about kitsch when it come, came to like Peppa, Peppa on Osorio, right? So kitsch cheap, typically is like cheap sort of decoration, right? And so this is a life size figurine. It looks like a little porcelain figurine, right? That maybe someone would collect, but this is a like, so full scale, I think the, the, the police officer is probably about six feet tall, which probably makes the bear like seven or eight feet tall, right? So it's kind of like over the top, kind of kitschy, like what's the focus of it? So for our piece, we have the pink panther and he's being held by James Manfield. Does anyone know who pink pan the pink panther is? Does anyone know what the pink panther is? Isn't he a detective or like from this cartoon? Yes. And so, very popular music. So, right? Okay. And so then, so he's this cartoon pink panther, right? He's literally pink. And then does anyone know who James Mansfield is? Jane Mansfield. She was a B movie actress. So, what do I mean by B movie? Does anyone know what I mean by B movie? Does anyone know what I mean by B movie? <laughs> we are just attacked by Mr. Cole. Anyone? So a B movie would be a lesser, like this would, instead of making millions of dollars as an actor, right? This is probably someone who made, a, you know, tens of thousands, right? As an actor. So someone who basically made a living as an actor, but wasn't like a super, super popular art, art um, actor. And so Jane Mansfield, right? was you know in popular culture but she wasn't the most famous actress of her day right so he kind of draws on the her celebrity as well as the lack of celebrity in the piece so here is our 230 the pink panther and there's a couple of things going on here when we look at it at it is it original or is this a copy of an existing figurine do you think there exists a image of the Pink Panther with James Mansfield hugging him. Do you think that exists? Probably not, right? So this is his creation. He came up with the idea that he wanted the Pink Panther to be held by a James Mansfield character who's basically like a hula girl, right? In the 1950s, it was really common to have hula girls on your dashboard. So from Florida, as you drive, she would dance and sway with the movement of the car. And so she sort of looks like one of those hula girls. So he conceptualized the creation of this being made. Right? And I think if they ever compared it to another piece in the 250, I think that they would compare it to the Maryland Diptych, right? How is it similar to the Maryland diptych? Isabella Ioka, you can take a second. How do you think this is similar to the Maryland diptych? Like pop culture references. Right, there's a pop culture reference with the Pink Panther and James Manfield. How about visually, Erin? How is it visually similar? Um, I would say the bright coloring and uh the contrast uh, from Marilyn Dipsy 
compared to the uh, sculpture on the left because the pink panther and uh, the hula girl, that's a really big contrast. Right. And Jeff Koons is very educated on the real world. And I guarantee you, when he was thinking about what character to put into this, he was thinking of the pink face of Marilyn Monroe's face. And he was thinking about the bleach blonde hair, right? So we have kind of like the matching yellows. And he was thinking about the teal of her, her shirt or her dress here when he decided what color he was gonna use for the skirt. Cause he could have used the grass green skirt, couldn't he have, right? So he, he probably was thinking about this painting, this, the serigraphy painting, right? When he was designing this sculpture, right? And then I do like the idea of the contrast too. It's this strange juxtaposition of this hula girl embracing this cartoon figure, right? It's kind of silly, right? So here you can see kind of comparing, they're, they're both were considered to be sex symbols, right? Um, they, were, they were kind of a sense of fakeness to them with their bleach blonde hair, right? Um, so you can see the comparisons here. Here you actually get to see the other side of it, right? And so how does the media, color, and subject matter address low art or kitsch, right? How does the way that it was made make it more low art? So we kind of talked about this already, but if we were going to kind of focus on it, besides it having those bright colors, it also has this gloss finish to it. It's very shiny which makes it feel kind of fake, right? And make it in a way feel kind of cheap, right? But like I mentioned, there's some controversy connected with the work of Jeff Kuhn. Um, one of the major things that he does is he makes pieces to make a large sum of money, right? You know, he's focusing on con consumer consumerism. And so this was made in a factory in Germany by a German and Italian craftsperson. So this was made in a factory, not in a studio, right? And he actually had three of them made at the same time. And then they went on exhibit in three different locations. So in the, instead of there just being one of these sculptures, there's three of them, right? And so it kind of is this idea of mass production, right, mass production. I think it's interesting that he didn't make more. He could have been like um, Kasumi, right? Where she made so many more to talk about consumerism. So these were actually in Cologne, Chicago, and New York at the same time when they were first exhibited. So I think it's really hilarious to be able to compare the two sides together because like Aaron was saying, there's kind of this strange juxtaposition of the Pink Panther and the Hula um, James Mansfield character, right? Notice how the emotions are different. How would you characterize the emotion of the Pink Panther, Raheel? If you're gonna put an emotion onto him, what would you give it? I would say it's kind of like, a hug or like lovely. right it's very lovingly like a hug like this whole side and you know there's this loving connection between the two of them and when you look at him in particular doesn't he look a little sad or scared right he doesn't look like he's a trickster he doesn't look like he's up to something which is normally how we see the pink panther character by which you probably aren't super familiar with he was kind of like a trickster. And so here he seems sad or hurt. And so she's embracing him. And then on the other side, right? She looks completely different, doesn't she? Right? When we look at the other side, she's overly sexualized, right? She's got large breasts. She's got red fake nails. She's got that bright yellow hair. She just looks over the top fake, right? And when you look at her, she's happy, she's joyous, and he looks kind of limp and defeated, right? 
So that could be kind of a sexual undertone as well, which is another thing he addresses a lot in some of his pieces. I, th I believe he married a porn star and had created a billboard series with him and her. It was very disturbing when I went to go see that exhibit at MoMA. I took my children, it was not good. I had to pull them out of the room really fast. Actually, it wasn't MoMA, it was the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. So it has this contrast in size. Any questions on our, what's it called again? <laughs> I'm sorry, Pink Panther, I think, right? Yeah, Pink Panther. Here's some other pieces. Like I said, this is his puppy topiary. So it's made out of metal and it's covered with plants. And this goes on the outside of a lot of museums. Right? Um, this is another neoconceptual artist, Felix Torres. If you've ever been to the Art Institute in Chicago, you might have seen his work. There's one where there's a pile of candy in the corner. And so basically what this is, is um, he um, himself, as well as his um, partner had AIDS. And so when his partner contracted AIDS, um, he was a certain weight. And so what he did is he would weigh the candy and it would weigh what he what it weighed while he was at like his like ideal health and then people in the gallery are, are asked to take a piece of candy as kind of remembrance of like the sweetness of life so every day people walk by this piece taking candy and every day the museum refills it back to his initial weight so it kind of is always kind of this sense of joy and remembrance of his partner who died of AIDS. I think they have another piece too, where they have these giant sheets of paper that you can take and then, and draw on. And then you can like, once again, they replenish it every single day. Okay. Um, the next piece we have is a really difficult one for me. So we're gonna hope I do a good job of explaining it to you. And this is called Pure Land Mar by Mariko Mori. So number 241. So she's a Japanese artist who emphasizes the, the merging of tra um, traditional Japanese culture with consumerism. And I would, I would definitely say she has kind of a nod with not just regular consumer, consumerism, but definitely Japanese consumerism. So what I want to do is to have you guys just take a few moments to look at what we see, right? If you want to, you can sketch the image or you could just take some time to look at it. And I want you to focus on, on what you see in the foreground, the middle ground, and the background, okay? So just take a few moments to look at it. Look at it from front to back. Okay, Eva, can you help me out? What do you see in the foreground and maybe the middle ground? So what do you see like kind of in the front and the middle? Is Eva here? Looks like she left. Let's see if I can find someone else to help. Varun, do you mind helping? Yeah, sorry, my wife was just breaking up. Can you like repeat it quickly? Um, can you help describe what you see in the foreground and the middle ground? Yeah, so there's all like these weird aliens on these blue clouds over this lake with brown goop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> very good. Right there's it's kind of a strange sort of creation right and so when we kind of break it down into its simplest parts jot this down your note takers we have a central figure who floats above a lotus blossom. 
right? So we have a lotus blossom kind of floating in water and we have this um, central figure, right? Kind of hovering above. And then we have these six little alien musicians swirling around on bubbly clouds, right? If you look at the setting, we've got this water and then we have this distant landscape, right? You've got this distant landscape. And when I look back here on the landscape, this, there's this strange cre like um, structure. It sort of looks like to me, like it belongs to like Haranus Meshvash, which isn't in the 250. It's one of those pieces that probably should be, but the Garden of Earthly Delights kind of look like it's this alchemy kind of creation. Um, it could be a temple. It could be a spaceship. We don't know what that is, right? And then there's this distant landscape, right? You see mountains and see the sun coming up or going down, right? And so this is the context of this is that this is a video interactive display. So we have a still here of a movie. This is a still of a movie. I have never been able to find the movie like I did a Bill Viola, right? But this is a interactive exhibit where it was an interactive exhibit um, that she called Pure Land. And it's based on a illustration of the concept of Nirvana. Right, so that Buddhist and Hindu concept of Nirvana. Uh, so what she did to kind of uh, make money off of this video is that they took stills of the movie and they printed them on glass. So many of the pieces that you see today are printed on glass um, and hung on the wall. Right, so what is her function? Why would she capture a still? Of, of a particular moment on the glass, right? It could be to um, make money, right? Could be very practical, right? But it also could be kind of this idea of capturing a moment to meditate on, right? So if I go back to this still here, right? She's got a mudra, right? This is not the one that we have in the 250, but this is another image. She's got her hands in mudra. She's sitting on um, a lotus flower, just like our representations often of Buddha, of Buddha or Bodhisattvas, right? And so she's sitting there. So it could be this kind of spiritual meditation that you're supposed to have while you look at this image, right? But the interactive, the video part of this is kind of interesting. So what you would do is you would go into a darkened room with 3D glasses. And then the audience was kind of limited to about 200 people. And so there was a seven minute video where the central figure would hum and whisper, right? Basically she would chant um, that kind of led to the sense of meditation. And the little musicians, those little alien musicians would float around and play music. And at the very end of the seven minute video, there was a fan that would come on in the room and it would spray scented air. So you guys ever been to one of those 40 movies at like amusement park, like Legoland or like, I'm trying to think of places I've gone. Um, Noah's Ark in Wisconsin Dells the SpongeBob experience, they splatter water on you and they spray scent at you and it's a movie, it's interactive. That's basically what this experience was like, right? Is that you would see it, you would hear it and you could smell it, right? Um, and you know, you'd feel the breeze there as well. So it was interactive and it's supposed to be intimate. So what time of day do you think it is? What time of day do you think it is? Jasmine, any guesses? Either sunset or sunrise. Very good. This is supposed to be at dawn, right? It's supposed to be at dawn, kind of like the start of a new day, right? 
And there's a lot of different symbols, right? And so there's a lot of symbols. My animation was off, which is good because we're towards the end of the period anyway. So the setting, supposedly the setting of this is of the Dead Sea. So just like when we saw the spiral jetty of the Great Salt Lake, keep in mind that the Dead Sea, right, is a symbol, right? And it, so it's a symbol of that it supports no life, right? But salt is often used as a purification agent in Shintoism. So remember Shintoism was this religious belief in Japan, right? That existed before and is often some sort of like merged later with Buddhism about kind of that belief in nature, right? So the symbol of the Dead Sea is that it supports no life, but also used for purification, right? The lotus blossom that we mentioned before is something we've seen in Hinduism and Buddhism, right? And it's a symbol of purity and rebirth in paradise. It also could collect the soul, right? So sometimes it also is there to select, to um, collect the soul. The central figure could be like the Amida Buddha or the Japanese version of it. So I apologize for my mispronunciation. The, Kich the Kichi Jotan, right? Um, which is a symbol of fertility, fortune, and beauty. So the central figure is a figure of fertility, fortune, and beauty. So she's a goddess. And then all of these symbols, right? She has a hand mudra, right? And her, her mudras are a blessing and teaching, right? She has a stone in her left hand, which is this magical wishing stone, right? The creatures, those strange aliens could be like bodhisattvas. Remember bodhisattvas aid people in their um, reaching um, of enlightenment right, in their reaching of enlightenment. And then the building could be a stupa, right? It could be a stupa. Um, some people look at it and think it looks very similar to like the Tibetan um, stupas, which, which of course are burial mounds, remember? And these are places where you might meditate. So there's a lot of symbolism here. You can see once again, it's one of those, it's tricky. It's tricky for me too, because there's all these different layers of meaning to it. And some of it's review for us and some of it's new with some of the newer vocabulary. Right? So here we have in a, a Buddhist illustration of Pure Land. This is from the high end period, right? And so this is the, the image of paradise, right? This is an image of paradise. So we have our central figure, right? If we compare them, they both have their central figures and they're both kind of floating in space. So look at all those wispy clouds that these little bodhisattvas sit on, kind of reminiscent of our little aliens. So bodhisattvas is aliens. Why would she choose that? Let's think again about what her art is about. Her art is about the blending of traditional Japanese culture with consumerism. How could this be reflective of that? Any educated guesses? Cora, any guesses? Um. Maybe it's like, because a lot of times like consumerism like involves around like toys and like cheap items and maybe that like that's what the aliens represent. Exactly. And I, I don't dare, you know, pretend that I understand all about Japanese consumerism. You guys might understand it more than me. I have looked at history and kind of seen things like manga and Hello Kitty and a lot of the characters and be like, I don't understand why people think this is so awesome. Like, 
And Hello Kitty's been around since I was a kid. Like it was one of those things I didn't really get. Maybe it's just too pink for me, but it is possibly a connection with the obsession of cartoons and other stuff that you buy. And especially in Japan, right? This is stuff that we of course buy. And my kids love Pokemon, right? Um, however, right? In Japan, it's really over the top, right? People have collections of all of this stuff. Is there any similarities between these two works? Mori made herself into Kichijoen. So once again, we have the artist as the central character. Right, so we had that here too, right? This is the artist, this is the photographer. So is she recreating the goddess or is she playing dress up, right? It could be also looking at the idea of cosplay, right? That she is dressing up like another character. So once again, looking at popular culture. I'd say so see you know there's a sense, sense of you know is she fake right is this supposed to be like a meditation on popular culture it's she kind of leads it to be ambiguous somebody made a fake smart history which is kind of hilarious if you're interested in watching it so it this was done by not the people at smart history it was probably like a final exam project for some school okay um, I'll show you some other examples. Um, oh, golly, now I can't remember his name. Sorry, do I have it here? Um, this is Murakami, that's it. And he's known for um, these eye images that he does. And so these really round kind of manga inspired eyes with eyelashes. Um, he did a joint venture with Louis Vuitton and did a print for one of their handbags. But he's known for these kind of over the top um, manga inspired paintings. And then we even see, kind of like Jeff Koons, these manga characters made into three dimensional to kind of look at, you know, make them physical. But like, are they art or are they kitsch? Are they popular culture? So there's some controversy with some of this stuff as well, right? So we're going to stop there. So tomorrow we'll finish 129 and 130 since we didn't finish it today. Okay. Any questions?